Today we're taking a full in-depth look at Codex Blood Angels. Let's see all the fancy new toys that the Sons of Sanguinius can bring to bear. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy-focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Today we're going to be reviewing the leaks rules for Codex Blood Angels, including their all-important stratagems, warlord traits, death company characters, relics, sanguinary discipline and much more. In terms of the leaks that we have to offer, we don't have anything for the crusade section yet, so if I get a chance I will try and cover that in another video. And the only other thing that we don't have confirmation on is the exact data sheets for every single unit, though pretty much all soft signs indicate that they're not going to be any different to the Index Astartes. Their points are the same, and all their war gear is the same, though it's not impossible there might have been a few tweaks and revisions. We do have all the really important stuff that I was looking forward to though, so let's see what we have in the supplement. So rules wise we have a few general army rules, we've got Savage Echoes and Black Rage, specific rules for dealing with Blood Angel's successor chapters, and it's quite fun that they can now take custom ones if they should so wish. They have four unique secondaries, and the usual things that you can expect to customise characters with, relics, special issue war gear, warlord traits, the sanguinary discipline, their unique psychic spells, and their unique option to upgrade certain characters to death company. Then we have all their unique data sheets and the points values of them, and quite importantly none of the points changes have changed whatsoever since the index, we still have 30 points sanguinary guard, who I was slightly worried would go up in points a bit, they're just insanely strong for the points. So first we have the core rules for the blood angels, three different layers of scary combat buffs, starting with red first, which is plus one to advance and charge, and plus one to wound in the first round of combat, when you've charged, were charged, or made a heroic intervention. It's been really solid since Blood of Baal last year, plus one to charge is exactly what you want on deep striking infantry, and plus one to wound is one of the most powerful damaging close combat buffs that any chapter gets. It's particularly solid with any low strength weapons such as chainswords or lightning claws, really making them far more efficient against heavy targets as well. Next we have Savage Echoes, which did have its wording revised a little. The Assault Doctrine already gives you an extra AP in combat, this will also give you an extra attack in the first round of combat, again if you charged, were charged or made a heroic intervention. I believe that the wording has changed slightly to mean that if you put a unit in Assault Doctrine with a stratagem or ability, I believe that that means that you would get Savage Echoes on that attack, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Finally we have Black Rage in its new form, it was changed slightly when we went into the Index Astartes, it's now plus one attack on the first round of combat just like the other two buffs, rather than being only if you charged. You also get that very nice 6 plus feel no pain, which is particularly good on two wound infantry, though now the ability does come with some trade offs as well, you can't do any actions, and you can't choose to fall back once you're in combat. An extra attack's always nice, but those two could genuinely be quite annoying in the wrong situation, and I feel like they're some of the things making Death Company just a little bit less attractive than Sanguinary Guard right now. Next let's move into Stratagems, which I'd say is a little bit of a mixed bag. A couple of favourites are back, but a couple of the others have come back in a different and weird form. First up, Descent of Angels has been rewritten. This was the one that gave us a 3d6 inch charge and was a really strong option. Sadly that 3d6 charge is gone, which means that pretty much any charge out of Deep Strike is going to carry at least some risk of failing, other than this which you could pretty much guarantee you were getting in. Descent of Angels now gives you plus one to hit in shooting a melee for a unit that's come in from reserve, and you can also choose to ignore any or all charge roll modifiers if the opponent did have something that subtracted from your charge range. I'll be honest, it's just a little bit problematic as you have to declare it at the end of your movement phase, and if you did want plus one to hit on a fighty melee unit, you don't actually know whether they're going to be making that charge yet or not. You could be spending one command points to make your fighty units plus one to hit, and then only go on to fail the charge later that turn. It sounds like a bit of a high stakes gamble to me. It will be quite nice for anything with mixed roll, things that have shooting and melee, like sanguinary guard. I should say that the stratagem is also limited to core jump pack units, so it's basically them, death company or vanguard vets, or one of the primaris units such as inceptors or suppressors. So annoying that you have to commit early, and to be honest this will be more reliably useful on something like inceptors. Could be very nice of them to have a unit of 5 plasma ones jump down and be automatically hitting on 2 pluses. Next up we have Vengeance for Sanguinius, this is one command point, and it's very niche, ball rerolls to hit and wound against Black Legion, great in that one niche matchup, I guess that'll show them for killing our Primarch. Next we have Refusal to Die, which is one or two command points, and it's the one for the 5 plus feel no pain on Death Company, that you only activate when your unit's chosen as the target of an attack. It costs 2 CP if the unit's 6 or more models strong, but otherwise it's a fairly reasonable durability boost, it makes them around about 25% tougher, and slightly better than that against damage 2 weapons. 
Could be worth it if you want to give yourself the maximum chance of surviving till the next turn, or just soaking up a bit more enemy fire. Angel's Sacrifice is one command point and was previewed by Warhammer Community. This one means that any opponent in engagement range must target one Blood Angel's character that uses this, so theoretically he could try and tank wounds for a different character or another squad that's in combat. I guess maybe it could be good if you're charging a massive Death Star unit and you've got one expendable character there who's going to tank wounds for the rest of the squad that's going to get stuck in and get the job done. It could actually be a pretty interesting combo with the Sanguinor. He can come out of nowhere into combat with his Miraculous Saviour rule, so provided you're willing to lay his life down for the cause, you could potentially save any one squad. Could certainly be worth it if you have a fighty Blood Angel squad that's just about to kill an enemy melee threat if they don't get killed first, but that will be a very expensive tactic, as he's quite an expensive model in himself. Next we have Spiritual Might, which allows you to cast one extra Psychic Power. I guess could potentially be good on Mephiston or Libby Dreadnought, say if you already use Quickening and Wings, and you desperately need to throw out a Smite on top of that. Visions of Sanguinius is one for Death Company characters. It allows you to do two different Visions of Sanguinius at the same time, or use another one if you've already used one of them earlier in the game. I could see situations where this could pay off, or we'll get to Death Company characters later. For one CP, we have Lucifer Pattern Engines. This is now a pre-game stratagem that you use on non-fly vehicles, and it basically means that it will always advance 6 inches, rather than having to roll. You also can't use it on Dreadnoughts, by the way, just in case you were hoping for that. I guess this one's okay. It is a moderate buff to mobility. I guess if you're desperate to use it, it might be best on something like a transport, like an Impulsor or a Rhino. Something that you might have been sure that you were going to be advancing on turn 1. I'm just not sure it's really worth it though, as Blood Angels already have very decent advanced rolls on account of Red Thirst. Next we have Red Rampage, which was also previewed. It's no longer the very helpful extra D3 attacks for characters. It's now an army-wide buff in the Assault Doctrine, where across your whole army, if you roll any wound rolls of 6, then you get an extra pip of AP with melee weapons and pistols. For example, an Astartes Chainsword in the Assault Doctrine, that will be AP-2 normally. If you roll a 6, then it's AP-3. It's only really going to be worth it on low AP weapons, and you're going to need a lot of them to really make this add up. If you do have a couple of chainsword heavy units in combat at the same time, it could well be worth it. It's amazing to get an army wide buff for one command point, but as army wide buffs go, it isn't the strongest I'm afraid. Next we have Fall on Fury though, which is back, and it's pretty much just as good as before. It now either costs one command point on a unit of five or less death company, or two command points on one that's six or more, and you get to pre-game move up to 12 inches, hopefully getting your death company far closer to the enemy, and potentially in easy reach for a first turn charge. It's a really solid option, and now Death Company are reasonably tanky with two wounds rather than one. They're far less of a liability to start on the board, as before you kind of ran the risk of them just being gone straight off the table if you didn't get first turn. Really solid and very intimidating if you just set up a big unit of them at the front of your deployment zone. Next we have Upon Wings of Fire, which I'm sad to say has been nerfed. It's one command point on Blood Angel's core jump pack units, so it can't be used on characters anymore I'm afraid. And now rather than instantly teleporting a unit of jump pack troops across the board, you have to wait a turn for it to take effect. So you take them off the board in one movement phase, they don't come back until the next movement phase. Really sad to lose such a powerful option for good. It looks like if we want guaranteed first turn charges, the options are now either Forlorn Fury or Drop Pods. Next we have Chalice Overflowing for one command point. This allows your Sanguinary Priest to use their Blood Chalice ability twice. Blood Chalice is their new ability to give any Blood Angels units the Assault Doctrine, though it does have to be done in the Command phase, which means that you won't be able to use it out of Deep Strike, which is kind of annoying. If you are using a Sanguinary Priest, then it could well be worth it, but it is a little bit of a niche in application. You're only really going to use it turn 2 when you're actually making charges, but before you actually get into Assault Doctrine. Would have been nice if it actually gave a bit of a benefit when they were in Assault Doctrine as well, much like the Space Wolves got for a similar ability. Finally, Unbridled Ardor is one command point now, and I'm afraid this one's got a bit more specific as well. It is still a 6 inch heroic intervention, but it's only usable by Sanguinary Guard units. I believe that that would include the Ancients as well, so you could get a 6 inch heroic intervention with him. And to be honest, it's still very very useful any time that you could use this. If you can pay one command point to get a free fight phase out of your Blood Angels, you're usually doing quite well. Just a shame not to have the army wide heroic intervention threat, much like the Space Wolves do. We do have a few more stratagems to go, but these ones are the core Blood Angels ones. I'm not going to lie, we have lost some powerful options with this. On Wings of Fire and the 3d6 inch charge were ones I was really quite hoping would come back. For me, the most powerful of these might be Descent of Angels, particularly used on Inceptors now. Getting plus 1 to hits for 1 CP is pretty excellent. For Lorne Fury to be used on pre-game Death Company to get them up the board, and on Bridled Ardor for Sanguinary Guard whenever you can use it. I'd say the rest are just about okay or a bit niche, 
and I think that Blood Angels aren't going to be quite as CP stretched as they were previously. It means that we can hopefully spend a bit more on things like Warlord Traits and Relics for pre-game boosts. Moving on to the Flesh Terrors ones and the generic ones that most Space Marine chapters get. Flesh Terrors get aggressive onslaught for 1 command point. This makes your infantry pile in and consolidate 6 inches, which could be pretty helpful for tying up enemy units that weren't expecting to be in melee. And they also have Savage Destruction, which means if an enemy fails a morale test with an engagement range of Flesh Terrors, then they get minus 1 to their combat attrition. Morale shenanigans do tend to be a bit weak to be honest, I'm not sure this is usually going to be worth it. This aggressive onslaught could be really good if it does make the difference between snagging an objective or tying an enemy infantry unit up to stop them firing next turn. Finally, for the more generic ones, we have one command point for Angel Exemplar. This gives you an extra Warlord trait on your Warlord, provided he isn't a named character already. A really nice little tool for building Smash Captains, this. Getting two fighty Warlord traits all at once is pretty decent. There's the usual one to give a successor chapter a higher tier relic for one CP. And there's one command point for Angel Ascendant, which is a sergeant relic. You can give one of your sergeants a mastercrafted weapon, digital weapons, flesh render grenades, or quake bolts. Probably the mastercrafted weapon or the quake bolts are the pick of those. An extra bit of damage to his personal attacks, or having the chance to snap off a shot with your bolt pistol and make the entire squad plus one to hit in melee. Could be decent on a big squad of sanguinary guard or vanguard veterans, perhaps. So next up, we move on to warlord traits. We have six, and unfortunately some of them are still a bit underwhelming. The Codex Blood Angels Warlord traits really weren't that great when they came out. Artisan of War was by far the best pick, though I think that has been shaken up a little bit now. First we have Speed of the Primarch, which allows you to fight first. Not really very useful if you're charging, which you're likely going to be, as you'll be fighting first anyway. Not too bad though if you are being countercharged. Artisan of War no longer gives you the extra flat damage unfortunately, it now allows you to take an extra relic on top of one that you already had. That relic can either be Mastercrafted Weapon, Digital Weapons, Adamantine Mantle or Artificer Armor. I would say that the best use of that would be to get a Durability Relic and also a Damage Dealing Relic both on the same character. Say if you had a Lieutenant with the Armor Indomitus perhaps, you could give him a Mastercrafted Weapon to make him more hitty. Or say you had a Captain with a Hammer of Baal, you could maybe give him an Adamantine Mantle to keep him alive. Next we have Soul Warden, which I don't think is going to be taking quite so much. It's a 6 inch aura of 5 plus feel no pain against mortal wounds. It is a substantial durability increase against them, but it's only ever going to be all that useful if they're absolutely spammed. Say if you're hit by a barrage of smites from Grey Knights or Thousand Suns. I don't think it's going to be taken all that much, just because it's not really a take all comers option. Next we have Heroic Bearing, which extends Captain, Lieutenant and Chapter Master rerolls by 3 inches, and also gives you plus 1 leadership to core units within 9 inches. I would say that this one isn't too bad to be honest. Could be useful if you're dropping a buff captain alongside a fighter unit. It might allow them to give them buffs even when they've moved quite a long way into combat. In terms of fighty traits though, Gift of Foresight is probably the best. It allows your character per turn to reroll one hit, one wound and one saving throw. Now captains and lieutenants don't provide rerolls to themselves anymore. This is actually a really significant melee boost. With a captain that's hitting on twos and maybe wounding on twos with a thunder hammer or power fist, you might only fail one hit and one wound per turn, so it's really not far off getting four rerolls for that character. That saving reroll is really powerful as well, you'd really want to combine it with a storm shield, as it'll basically give you a 50-50 chance to shrug off the first damage you take each turn. If you want a generally effective fighty character, then I most certainly think about picking up this one, it's really really solid. Finally we have Selfless Valor, which is a 6 inch heroic intervention, it's not nothing, but it's not that great either. For the Blood Angels Warlord traits, I think the Gift of Foresight is possibly the best, and I'd weigh it up against the core book options, particularly things like the Imperium Sword. Fortunately, with that stratagem, you could potentially have both. Make a very, very scary character indeed, with re-roll charges, plus one strength and attack on the charge, all those re-rolls, and also re-rolling a saving throw. There's a Warlord that's just going to be all-round effective. For the Flesh Terrors, we've also got three Warlord traits, Merciless Butcher is plus one attack for every five models within three inches. Very niche to be honest, I would still pick Imperium Sword over that one. Just because against some armies you might be tangling against tanks or elite armies and then never get the use of this buff. Of Wrath and Rage is a bit more universal. It's essentially exploding sixes where every six to hit grants you an additional hit. If you're hitting with a Power Fist or Thunder Hammer, then that's roughly a 25% increase in damage output, so is isn't too bad. Finally, probably my favourite of the three is Cretation Born. It's re-roll charges and no overwatch. Very similar to the old Blood Angels Angel's Wing. And having a no overwatch tool in the army can be really handy against certain matchups such as Tau. So let's move on to the relics that we can give our characters then. To start off, I am sad to report that some of the staples have gone. Angel's Wing doesn't exist anymore. 
nor does the standard sacrifice, the one that gave you the 5 plus feel no pain aura, nor does the biomantic sarcophagus for the librarian dreadnoughts. Blood Angels have 5 higher tier relics, and then some special issue war gear. The higher tier relics are Wrath of Bar, this one's used on a Blood Angels Ancient, and it's a 6 inch aura, where all jump pack units within 6 inches will get plus 2 to their move characteristic. If you are thinking about starting a significant amount of jump packs on the board, this one could be a really decent one to have in the middle of them. It will add up to shorter charge rolls and more options over the first couple of turns. If you're deep striking a lot of units, you might consider the Icon of the Angel instead. This one's a 6 inch aura of re-rolling charges. Quite nice that its range has gone up, meaning it's a bit more flexible, but it's now only re-roll the charge roll, it's not re-roll any or all of the dice. I honestly think that I might be taking this one fairly regularly. Having this on a character and then have a squad of Sanguinary Guard or Death Company deep strike on either side of them means that you've got a whole battle line with a lot of nice re-rolls to charge. Next we have the Relic Death Mask, Visage of Death. It makes the bearer minus one to hit in melee, which is kind of useful, and it also gives you a 3 inch aura of ignoring objectives secured on enemy units, which I think is theoretically quite nice, but I'm not sure how much difference there's going to make the vast majority of the time. You're not going to care about it at all if you still have less models than the enemy, or if you do just wipe them off the objective anyway with all of your death from the skies. Looking far more attractive this time round is the Hammer of Bar. This one essentially hasn't changed since the start of the Codex. It's still a strength 2 AP-3 Thunder Hammer with damage 3 and no minus 1 to hit. I say it is looking far more attractive now though, because most Thunder Hammers are now AP-2 as per the Codex, so this one is an upgraded version and you'll still only be paying 20 points for it on characters. Against relevant targets such as a Toughness 7 vehicle, this increases your Thunder Hammer's hitting potential by 55%, and it makes it far superior to choosing a Mastercrafted weapon in terms of eventual damage output. Finally, for the Core Blood Angels relics, we have Galleon's Staff. This one's for a Librarian with a Force Stave, and you add one to Psychic Tests for the Sanguinary Discipline, and it's decently feisty with Strength plus 3, AP minus 2, and Damage D3. It is quite a meaningful buff to casting Psychic Tests, and I would think about using this with a support librarian, say some guy dropping down with a jump pack, to cast things like Unleash Rage or Shield of Sanguinius on other deep striking units. We also have a couple of relics for the Flesh Terrors as well. There's the Crimson Plate, which gives you plus one movement, and it also lets you advance and charge. Unfortunately, it is only usable on Terminator armor, so you're still not going to be all that fast. But to be fair to them, it does increase their average charge threat range from 12 inches to 16 or 17 so it could at least go halfway to letting a Terminator keep up with a jump pack force. They also have a Relic Chainsword called Severa, which is Strength plus 2, AP minus 2, and Flat Damage 2, and on wound rolls of 5+, plus, you get an additional Mortal Wound. It's interesting, and could potentially be good against very tough targets, but I suspect, as is often the case with Relic Chainswords, you might well just be better with the Teeth of Terror for the extra 3 attacks. I'll be honest, the Relic choice isn't amazing for the Blood Angels here, though most are usable in some form, I think I could see myself running the Icon of the Angel and the Hammer of Baal most often, maybe thinking about Wrath of Baal if we're having lots of jump pack starts on the board, and Galleon Staff for a support librarian should we want to run one. We do also get some special issue war gear, which successor chapters can also take. We have all the usual suspects here, the Adamantine Mantle, the Artificer Armor, Mastercrafted Weapon, and Digital Weapons. Maybe with a bit new relevance, now they can be taken in addition to other relics, with that Warlord trait, Artisan of War. In addition to this, we have the Quake Bolt. This allows you to fire a single shot from a bolt weapon, and if you hit the target with it, then it's felled, and all your Blood Angels units get plus one to hit against it in melee. Honestly, on paper, I really do quite like these. I like the idea of a character just marking a target for death each turn, and for a captain between this and his reroll aura, you get a serious amount of extra damage output point for point. It is just a bit annoying, though, having to take a bolt weapon when you might be wanting to take a storm shield or something, and they do take a bit more forethought and planning to work compared with other buffs. Next we have the Archangel Shard, this one's a Power Sword or Mastercrafted Power Sword, and it trades its profile for Strength plus 2, AP minus 4, and Flat 2 damage. It's just extra kelly against Chaos, where it goes to Flat 3 against Chaos units, or Flat 4 against Chaos monster units. I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of this one, you might just be better off taking the more Take All Comers Burning Blade, which is Strength 7 and AP minus 5. It's certainly not the biggest upgrade compared with the standard Captain or Lieutenant Mastercrafted Power Swords that you get on the characters in the Indomitus set. Next we have the Flesh Render Grenades, which might just be the worst relic here. They're 6 inch frag grenades with only D3 shots, made at Strength 5, AP-3 and Damage 2, ignoring Light Cover. You can't use them out of Deep Strike, and their damage output might kill one extra Space Marine or something. But honestly, if you're taking a relic for a character and you are getting them within 6 inches of the enemy, you may as well take something to make them better in melee, as melee is where Blood Angels excel. 
Finally, we do still have one relic jump pack, which are the gleaming pinions. These now allow you to re-roll charges and to fall back and charge. So nice to see another little way that you can re-roll charges on 8 inch out of deep strike. And fall back on charge is genuinely quite useful. It means that your opponent's not going to be able to pin your character in place. They'll be falling back and charging exactly what they want. As I said previously, a real shame to lose the Angel's Wing, the 5 plus feel no pain, and the Biomantic Sarcophagus, but there are still plenty of decent relic options here. Next we move on to the Return Sanguinary Discipline, which I'm sure people who own Mephiston or Librarian Dreadnoughts will be very glad to see back, and it's more or less intact as it was before, with just a few tweaks. Firstly, every single power is now Warp Charge 6, so at least relatively easy to cast most things, and Wings of Sanguinius, while it's taken a very slight nerf, is pretty much just as good as before. First up we have Quickening, which is Warp Charge 6, and it's a blessing that affects the Psyker. You get plus D3 attacks, and you get to reroll Advance and Charge rolls. This one's a very solid pick on a Librarian Dreadnought or on Mephiston himself, both of whom get very very scary melee attacks in Ds, so having more reliable charges and increased damage on the charge is no bad thing. Unleash Rage is Warp Charge 6, it's 12 inch in range and you have to target one of your core units now. This one's changed slightly, rather than getting an additional attack, every unmodified hit roll of 6 scores 1 extra hit. This one's a bit of a side grade really, it's pretty much just as good as it was before in terms of eventual damage output. The vast majority of Blood Angels units on the charge are going to get just as much damage output as they were before, and as you get into the later few turns, if you do turn on some of the combos that get you crazy amounts of attacks, say Vanguard Veterans for example with two Chain Swords, Shock Assault and Savage Echoes, you're actually going to be getting more damage output than you were before because you have more attacks that are proxying more hits on sixes. Particularly good if you're going to be buffing things in the Assault Doctrine. Next we have Shield of Sanguinius. This one's a Warp Charge 6 Blessing and it affects any Blood Angels unit within 18 inches and gives them a 5 plus Invul save. It perhaps could be a bit more helpful for giving an Invul save to a unit that's just about to charge in and is almost certainly going to get loads of enemy fire next turn. Really solid on Death Company in particular, or any Primaris that have a 3 plus save. It's interesting comparing this to Psychic Fortress, the one in the Core Codex that gives you a 6 inch bubble of 5 plus Invul. In the midst of an army that one might be better, but I could see the value of this one if you are going to be putting it on Blood Angels units that are going charging, as they're quite likely to be moving out of Librarian buff range. I could see a fun roll for a Blood Angel support Librarian, you could perhaps jump them down alongside some Death Company, give them Unleash Rage and Shield of Sanguinius and send them off, and if you're feeling even more generous then give them a Bolt Gun with Quake Bolts, and they'll be plus one to hit on the unit that they're charging. Not a fat lot's going to want to get in the way of that. Next up we have a couple of slightly underwhelming Witchfires. Blood Boil is 18 inch range, again it's Warp Charge 6, and you roll 2d6 and compare it to the target's toughness. If it's greater than the toughness then they get d3 mortal wounds, and if you roll double their toughness then it's a flat 3 mortal wounds instead. Basically a little bit superior to Smite if you're targeting anything that's toughness 3 or toughness 4, and I guess it's quite nice that you don't have to target the closest. Blood Lance has been rewritten a bit, but unfortunately it's still awful. Again a Warp Charge 6 Witchfire that targets an enemy unit within 18 inches, you draw a line between the two bases, your model and theirs, and every model along that line gives you a 5 plus chance to afflict a mortal wound on the unit. Basically you need your opponent to absolutely line up a whole ton of elite infantry for this to be worth it. Even if you do manage to cleverly spear 6 models along this line, you're still only getting 2 mortal wounds out of it on average, so you might as well just have been casting smites for lower warp charge. Sadly still not very good in my opinion. Finally we have the old favourite, Wings of Sanguinius. Warp Charge 6, and as before you gain Fly and 12 inch movement, and you then immediately get to move. I'm afraid it has been toned down a little bit compared with the previous version. In the last decks you got to keep that extra 12 inch movement and Fly for the next movement phase, but now it only applies for the duration of that Psychic phase. So basically for a Librarian Dreadnought, you're going to be moving 6 inches in the movement phase, and hopefully casting this for an extra 12. Still gives you a great threat range to be honest, 18 inches before a boosted charge, potentially re-rolling with Quickening. Still though, I was a bit worried that they might do something worse to this power, and getting the double move is the most important thing for me. I still think that Wings plus Quickening is going to be a really solid pick on Mephiston or Librarian Dreadnought. Other than that, I could see a role for a support Librarian with Shield of Sanguinius and Unleashed Rage, and to be honest I usually wouldn't bother with Blood Boil or Blood Lance, I think I'd just fall back on Smite instead. So next we have the option to turn our Captains and Lieutenants into Death Company versions. This was previewed in Warhammer Community the other day. Basically you can spend 20 points to upgrade a captain with black rage and death visions, or 10 points for a lieutenant. You can do this with up to one captain in your army, and up to two lieutenants. They do have a few other restrictions, they can't be your warlord, their reroll auras will only affect death company, they won't affect everyone, and weirdly enough they don't count towards the company command rule, so this could be a way to get two captains in one detachment. 
You could have one standard one, and then one that's full to the Black Rage. We already know what Black Rage does. One extra attack on the first round of combat, and a 6 plus fail no pain. It's a decent buff to damage and durability. Though I think it's kind of borderline whether or not it's worth it at 20 points if it was for just that ability. It's a bit annoying to have them locked out of being your actual Warlord, though I believe that you could still give them a Warlord trait with the Stratagem from Codex Space Marines, though again please correct me if I'm wrong. Perhaps the most interesting part of the rule is this new Death Visions ability, which you can use for any of your characters that have fallen to the Death Company, including the named ones that have the Black Rage, Chaplain Lamartes, and Death Company Tycho. With Death Visions, you don't have to pick them pre-game, but when your Death Company character is chosen to fight in the fight phase, you can pick one of three buffs. They see a sad vision of Sanguinius getting killed, and get inspired to fight in various different ways. They all do have restrictions, though. For the first one, you have to be able to see an infantry or monster character, and for the second two, you actually have to be within engagement range of an infantry or a monster character. I'd say that the keyword restriction is a bit harsh, to be honest. It means that if you're in combat with a bike character, you're not going to be able to use these, or say if you're fighting against a Tau battle suit or something. I wish they made it just a little bit less restrictive, to be honest. In any case, On the Bridge of the Vengeful Spirit can be used if you can see an infantry or monster character, which I think would usually be quite easy throughout the opponent's army. You get plus one attack for every five models within six inches of him, and you also get to re-roll all your hit rolls. This is actually a really solid buff in my opinion, particularly if you're using a Thunder Hammer or Power Fist when you get the minus one to hit. Maybe you might get an extra attack, perhaps more if you really are fighting a horde, but frankly it seems pretty worth it for the re-roll hits alone. Say you've got a Death Company Primaris Captain going in for the kill, he gets 5 attack space, 6 for Shock Assault, perhaps 1 for Savage Echoes and 1 for Black Rage, so he could be hitting 8 times with a Mastercrafted Power Sword or a Power Fist, and then you get to reroll all hits, and potentially get even more attacks if there's enemy units nearby. There's really not a lot that's going to want to stand in his way. The next one is Grace of the Angel. You have to be in engagement range of the monster or infantry character for this, and rather than being an offensive buff, this one's defensive and gives you a 3 plus invul save. Again, not too bad, though you only activate this when you're selected to fight, so it does mean that the opponent must not have killed you beforehand. Finally, and perhaps most interestingly, we have to Slay the War Master, where you trade out all of your combat damage for a 50-50 chance to do an absolute ton of mortal wounds. Your model makes no attacks, but you do a 50-50 roll-off, and if you win the roll-off, then you get d3 plus 3 mortal wounds. I think that this could be a really funny and gutsy way of having a light character try and take out something really nasty. You could use this with something as cheap as a bare bones lieutenant at 70 points, and basically have a 50-50 chance to do around 5 mortal wounds to a really scary enemy character. Certainly unreliable, and gives you a really high chance for your character getting killed, but this one is going to feel absolutely epic when it goes off and ends an enemy threat then and there. As we mentioned, we do have the chance to use two of these at once via that Death Vision stratagem. Could potentially be interesting to do that Slay the War Master one, and also combine it with the Grace of the Angel, so if he does fluff it, then he'll at least get a decent chance at saving those return attacks. Or perhaps combining the attacks boost with the Bridge of the Vengeful Spirit, again with the Grace of the Angel to keep them safe after. Overall, I'm perhaps a little bit borderline as to whether these are worth it or not. 20 points is quite a hefty upgrade for a captain, and I certainly wouldn't say it's an auto-include with the limitations, but in the right army list, if you only have Death Company to buff anyway, then between the Feel No Pain, Extra Attack, and the Death Visions rule, it could well be worth it. I think it's honestly a better deal on the lieutenants than the captain, as they only pay 10 points. Next, we have four unique secondaries for the Blood Angels, ones that you can use in the mission pack instead of the standard ones, or instead of the standard Codex Space Marine ones. First up, we have Blade of Sanguinius, this one's similar to the Space Wolf one, where you select one of your characters and the opponent selects one of theirs. You get 5 victory points if you can kill that character, 5 victory points if it's in melee, and 5 victory points if it's done by the character that you selected. Personally, I'd say it's quite unreliable, to be honest. Your opponent's going to know exactly what's coming, and is going to try and keep their character that they nominated safe at all costs. For No Mercy, No Respite, we have Fury of the Lost, which is potentially one of the strongest ones here. Nice and simple, you get 3 victory points per turn if a unit has been destroyed by a Death Company unit. If you have loads of Death Company in your list, then you're likely going to be killing something each turn. If you have a lot of them, it should be a pretty reliable way to getting something like 9 victory points. Though turn 1 it might depend on whether or not your opponent can foil Forlorn Fury, and things might be winding down by turn 5. Obviously if you've lost your Death Company units, then you're not going to be scoring any more by this. Definitely though, in an army list with lots of Death Company, this could be really solid. Next we have Death from Above, which I think is a bit harder to achieve. You get 2 victory points per turn if an enemy unit has been destroyed by a Blood Angels unit that's been set up as reinforcements this turn. I noticed that you only get 2 victory points rather than 3 with this. You only get 3 if you actually killed a character with that unit. 
and you're basically going to be limited to drop pods doing this turn 1, and then using it on Wings of Fire on turn 4 or 5, because under normal circumstances you won't be able to bring in normal reserves then. i say this one's really likely to be worth it to be honest. If you have a bad turn where you fail a charge or two, you might get nothing at all, and you have to make a lot of effort to make it work on the later turns in the first place. Finally, for Battlefield Supremacy, we have Relentless Assault, which is 4 victory points if there's more Blood Angels units in the enemy deployment zone than there are enemy units at the end of your turn. So basically you have to outnumber the opponent within their own drop zone, which isn't the easiest thing to do, even with an aggressive army such as Blood Angels. Blood Angels tend to be pretty elite to be honest, though if you're playing another super elite faction, maybe Imperial Knights or something, this might actually be fairly doable if you deep struck a lot of your units in their drop zone. Though I think it would be really quite a hard one to max, you're pretty much guaranteed not to be able to do this turn 1. So if you wanted your max 15 victory points, you'd have to be doing this every single subsequent turn. Honestly, it could be powerful in the right matchup if your opponent just has almost no board control and really elite units. For me though, this one and Fury of the Lost are probably the pick of the bunch, though you might well be better off going for ones from the core mission pack, which are just about destroying units and standing in table quarters, as Blood Angels tend to be quite good at both of those anyway. So next I thought we'd talk about datasheets. As I said previously, from these leaks we don't have absolute 100% confirmation on every detail here, but what we do have confirmation is that literally nothing has changed in points cost since the index, so if you want to know the points cost for your army, you can literally see that right now on the Games Workshop index download. There aren't any new datasheets since that one, and every piece of war gear from the war gear section has stayed exactly the same. I honestly think it's going to be very likely that this is going to be exactly the same as the Space Wolves, and none of the datasheets have changed since the index. I think the only addition that we know about for certain is that Lamartes and Death Company Tycho both are going to be getting the Death Visions of Sanguinius rule. With that in mind, I'm just going to go through the datasheets as we know them from the Index, talk about them in context of the new rules, and if any major changes surface later on, I'll put corrections down in a pinned comment at the top of the comment section. In any case, the unit that I'm pretty much most excited to use out of the book are Sanguinary Guard. I've already talked about them in a couple of videos, saying why they're possibly one of the strongest marine assault units right now. 30 points is a great price for them, they're fast, they're durable, and they're devastating on the charge. They're 2 wound critters and have 3 attacks each, so 4 with shock assault and 5 with savage echoes. I would say that the swords or the axes are now the best ways to run them, the power fist costs an extra 5 points, and it just doesn't add all that much when they're already getting plus 1 to wound most of the time. In addition, they also picked up minus 1 to hit in melee with those death masks, and they also have special affinity with guarding the warlord because they get plus 1 to hit when they're within 6 inches of 1. It makes a lot of sense to have them coming down right next to your warlord if you have the opportunity to. To cap it all off, they are a core unit as well, so make great use of the character reroll bubbles, and from the new stratagems that we've seen today, we know that they can now heroically intervene at 6 inches when all the other Blood Angels units can't. Now we know that their points are unchanged, I think they're safe and cemented in being one of the most commonly run Blood Angels units. Even just an 150 point unit of 5 of these is a threat to near enough anything in the game. A squad of 5 of them dropping down in the Assault Doctrine, even with literally no buffs from any characters or anything else, will do you around about 16 wounds to a Toughness 8 vehicle. They are odds on to one shot a Repulsor Executioner right out of Deep Strike. It's a shame that they were on Wings of Fire and 3d6 inch charge don't seem to be coming back, but still you could have 2 units of these Deep Striking alongside the Icon of the Angel. That's 2 8 inch rerollable charges, and you could have another one Deep Striking somewhere across the board and use a Command Point reroll on that one. Sure, you might get unlucky, but odds are you get 2 out of the 3 units in, which is plenty. While the Sanguinary Guard went down, the Ancient went up by quite a lot unfortunately. He no longer gives you reroll ones to wound, but it can now select a unit for getting plus 1 to hit in the Command Phase. The Command Phase stipulation is a bit problematic, as it means that he can't use it after he's deep striking, so for me he's a bit more of a start on the board character now. I'd maybe consider him with a Wrath of Bar Relic to start alongside some jump packs that start on the board, give them all some slightly boosted movement, buff them in melee a bit, and also gain the ability to fight when they die. Still though, he's very expensive for what he does now, I don't think he'll be run quite as much as before. Next we have the Death Company and Death Company Intercessors. Standard Death Company are now 22 points, or 25 points with jump packs, and the Death Company Intercessors are now 24. I think Standard Death Company are going to be weighed up against Vanguard veterans now. Do you want the extra attack from Black Rage and the 6 plus feel no pain, or do you want to jump pack this Vanguard veteran with a Storm Shield for exactly the same points cost? They have become a little bit more limited in their options as well, their max squad size is down to 10, and you have to either choose a Chainsword or a Bolter, you can't take both as was often the best way to run them. For gaining the 2 wounds they've got a bit less hitty point for point, but they're more tanky. 
and for me the biggest incentive to run them would be to use Forlorn Fury, which should net you a pretty much guaranteed first turn charge, or at least put a whole load of angry death company space marines right in the opponent's face. At least with two wounds apiece, they're going to take more than incidental firepower to take down, and should hopefully cause themselves to be quite a bit of a problem. Death Company Intercessors can either take Bolt Rifles or Chainswords, and they've gone up to being 6 attacks base, so have more attacks than the Death Company per model, though it is a bit sad that they can't take Jump Packs. These guys might be a fun option out of Strategic Reserve, hitting very very hard if they can make an 8 inch charge, or could be a potential option to put in an Impulsor, maybe 5 standard guys and 1 with a Power Fist. I think they could be quite interesting with their 6 plus Feel No Pain plus Transhuman Physiology, it could make even a small squad of them quite hard to shift. As for the Blood Angels motor pool, as is the case with most Dreadnoughts, they all gain Duty Eternal, so the Furioso is quite happy, though compared with the previous Codex, in the Index its movement did drop down to 6 inches, which is a bit unfortunate for something that wants to be in combat. It gets plus 1 attacks if it's armed with two close combat weapons, or it can trade one of them out for a Frag Cannon, which is 18 inches, heavy 2d3, strength 7, AP minus 1, damage 2, and blast. It can take a Magna Grapple, which honestly I wouldn't for 5 points. It gives you a chance at keeping a vehicle in combat with you should you happen to catch one. I would keep the Smoke Launchers for the option to use Smoke Screen should you need to. Sadly, unlike the core book Dreadnoughts, it doesn't seem to be core. The Death Company Dreadnought is only 5 points more than this. It gains Black Rage for the 6 plus Feel No Pain, and also an extra plus 1 attack on the charge. Can't take a Frag Cannon. And to be honest, if you want a dedicated melee beatstick Dreadnought, then it's really not too bad a shout. 6 plus Feel No Pain plus Duty Eternal means it's at least going to be a bit of a challenge to remove. The Bar Predators come down in points a little bit, it's 120 points with the Flamestorm, or 130 with the Assault Cannon. The Flamestorm Cannon is 18 inches rather than 12 now, and it gets the Overcharged Engines rule baked in, meaning that if it advances it always gets an extra 6 inch movement. To be honest though, you're rarely going to want to advance it, seeing as it's not going to be doing any damage if it does. Sadly, at the points cost it is, I still don't think it's all that effective. I still definitely say more of a fun and fluffy choice, as opposed to one that's going to be taken in competitive Blood Angels lists. Moving on to the HQ section now, Dante has gone up a little bit to 175, though his reroll aura has got worse, much like all chapter masters, as he can only nominate one unit for it rather than being everyone. The Axe Mortalis is now strength 7, AP minus 3, and damage 2, so a decent threat against everything, though he won't be quite as fighty as just a standard generic captain tooled up with relics and warlord traits. He does have a few other benefits though, seeing as he is the Lord Commander of the Blood Angels, you get one command point extra if he's your warlord, he's minus one to hit with his super death mask, and once per game he can use a free epic deed stratagem, which I think most of the time would be only in death to duty end to fight when he dies, but with the new codex you could also use angel sacrifice as well to make everyone attack him, which to be honest most of the time you don't want. I'd say he's not bad, he does have a fair amount going for him who is not quite as good to accompany Deep Strikers, seeing as that Chapter Master ability has to be declared in the Command Phase, and it means that you can't use it on the turn when he drops in. Gabriel Seth is 160 points, so has unfortunately taken a bit of a price bump, but he does get to fight twice in the Fight Phase, and he now gets 5 attacks at base. Again, his Chapter Master rerolls have been updated to the new version, and he has a special Aura rule, meaning that core units within 6 inches of him will get plus 1 damage on the roll of a 6. Seth hits very very hard with Blood Reaver, which is strength times 2, AP minus 2, and a flat damage 3, essentially a Thunder Hammer with no negative to hit, and to be honest getting hit by that 12 times in a row is going to ruin just about anyone's day. The Sanguinor is really quite an interesting choice now, he's 150 points, and he hits at strength 6, AP minus 2, and damage 2, and unmodified wound rolls of 6 inflict a mortal wound as well. He's become a bit different in the buffs that he gives, his plus 1 attack now only affects core units, and annoyingly it doesn't stack on top of Shock Assault, which you're going to get most of the time anyway, so it's a whole load less relevant. However, he is still minus 1 to hit in melee, he's gained a 6 inch heroic intervention, and his most interesting rule is his Miraculous Saviour, which means that if you've started him in reserve off the board, then he can become an interesting counter charge asset. If an enemy unit charges a Blood Angels unit in your army, he can then suddenly set up within engagement range of that enemy unit, and he counts as having made a heroic intervention that turn. The sudden appearance of a very fighty character could certainly turn a combat. It could be potentially interesting to use that Angel's Sacrifice ability on it as well, meaning that everything would have to target the Sanguinor, and he might well die, but it does mean that whatever unit that was being charged could be entirely free and unscathed to just attack back at whatever charged them. It could cost you a powerful asset, but that could potentially turn a whole game on its head if your opponent thinks he was just about to wipe out a huge unit of Sanguinary Guard or something. You could potentially use only in death to fight when he dies, just to add insult to injury. 
Next up we have Brother Corbula. He's been changed fairly significantly. He's still a decent sanguinary priest with strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 1 on his Heaven's Teeth Chainsword. And much like the standard sanguinary priest, his Red Grail now puts nearby core or character units in the Assault Doctrine, which could be potentially very useful if he's drop podding in alongside some scary Blood Angels turn 1. He also has the Apothecary style 6 plus feel no pain, and as a Chief Apothecary he can also heal a unit twice. He did used to have a single reroll ability, though he still gets some rerolls if you make him your Warlord, and he gets that Prophetic Visions trait where he gets to reroll a single hit, wound and save roll. Unfortunately Sanguinary Priests took a bit of a price hike, they're still 90 points on foot or 120 points with a jump pack, and again they still no longer provide a plus one strength aura, giving you the Assault Doctrine and their Apothecary Heals and 6 plus Feel No Pain instead. Unlike Brother Corbulo though, they have to nominate one Friendly Blood Angels Core or Biker units to be in the Assault Doctrine at the command phase, it's not a 6 inch aura like his Red Grail is, and that means that he won't be able to use it on the turn that he deep strikes in, meaning that it's going to be a lot better for starting on the board compared with starting in the sky. Like the Sanguinary Ancients, the jump pack version of him is really expensive at 120 points, and I'm honestly not too sure he's worth it for the buff when he could for the same points take almost an entire squad of Sanguinary Guard. Finally, we come to Mephiston and the Librarian Dreadnought, both of whom are very glad indeed to get Wings of Sanguinius and Quickening back, they were really missing them without them. Mephiston's 155 points, and he has the Chief Librarian tag, and is otherwise pretty much unchanged since 8th edition. Strength 10 in combat with AP minus 3 and D3 damage, toughness 5 with 6 wounds and a 5 plus feel no pain, he's just generally very fighty and going to be a pain to deal with. The Librarian Dreadnought has gone up just a few points, but it's kind of fair enough when he's gained Duty Eternal for that. He's also gained 1 additional attack, going up to 4 from 3, but he can only make 1 of those attacks with his Force Halbard, the rest have to be made with his standard Dreadnought close combat weapon. The Halbard's strength 8, and it's D3 plus 3 damage, so it can be quite good for skewering one high value target if you need it. Certainly a competitive option before, and I think it remains so now. He might be a little bit slower than he was compared with old style Windsor's Sanguinius, but between Quickening and Wings, he still has an absolutely whopping 27 inch average charge range threat. With Wings, both he and Mephiston are still going to get where they need to go. As I said, out of the data sheets, I think that Sanguinary Guard are just looking all round great. Death Company are really interesting with Forlorn Fury, because first turn charges are very nice, though I'm a little bit underwhelmed by the unique characters out of the HQ section myself. I think my first go-to would perhaps be the Librarian Dreadnought, and a tall up jump pack Smash Captain, who I think will outcompete plenty of the named guys. So overall, I do feel like we've gained quite a lot of options from this new codex, but I can't say it's the biggest buff ever compared with the Index. In particular, I think the worst things for the Blood Angels are getting no 3d6 inch charge out of Deep Strike, which really was one of their core stratagems. Wings of Fire being nerfed so you can't just teleport across the board in one turn, and losing the old style Red Rampage where you just get an extra d3 attacks on the charge with a character, which was one I found myself very commonly using. The Relic section is also looking a bit sadder as well, no Angel's Wing, no Biomantic Sarcophagus, and no Relic Standard of 5 plus feel no pain. There is plenty of good stuff to counterbalance it though, still getting access to all the gear from Codex Space Marines is really useful, the Teeth of Terror can make you a very cheap and very fighty character, the Imperium Sword is a beautiful close combat warlord trait that Blood Angel's commanders are going to love, and gaining access to the full roster of Space Marine units including things like Assault Centurions is no bad thing either. Sanguinary Guard remain 30 points and are still excellent, Wings of Sanguinius still gives you a double move and a crazy threat range from Mephiston or Dreadnought, and Forlorn Fury looks great on a big unit of Jump Pack Death Company, charging straight up turn 1. Interestingly for Death Company, I think that the Wings of Fire stratagem could still actually be really useful, they can't fall back, but they can use on Wings of Fire to jump out of close combat, so your opponent could be caught by surprise when they're not quite as stock there as they thought they might be. I think that the new Descent of Angels is really interesting, particularly good for Inceptors with either Assault Bolters or the Plasma Weapons. Jumping in and hitting them with a bunch of Plasma Shots hitting on 2s is going to ruin most units' day, and they seem to have made a decent effort to bring Smash Captains back. You could either go down the Death Company route, or get in two Warlord traits on your Warlord, one of the two. If you went with the two Warlord traits, you could think about giving them that Gift of Foresight, B-roll 1 hit roll, 1 wound roll, give them the Imperium Sword for plus 1 strength and attack, and then perhaps give them the Hammer of Baal, so they're hitting on 2s with a Thunder Hammer that's AP minus 3. It'd even be really tanky if you took a Storm Shield as well, where you get to re-roll one of the Storm Shield saves every turn. For the Death Company, you could perhaps just give them one Warlord trait with the Imperium Sword plus the Hammer, and then go for that Death Vision where you get the extra re-rolls and the potentially extra attacks, or you could think about upgrading a Lieutenant as a Suicide Lieutenant with the Death Company rule, and then maybe going for that to kill a Warmaster Strastium, where you can get a basically a 50-50 chance of one-shotting an enemy character. 
So overall, I wouldn't say that it's taken Blood Angels to the next level or anything. It's given us a few nice options back, maybe a few twists on certain units, but I think it's still going to be down to the Blood Angels chapter tactic, Death Company and Sanguinary Guards to really carry the codex in games. So let me know what you think of the Blood Angels Codex down in the comments below. I'm certainly looking forward to putting some more Sanguinary Guard on the table. And now Fall on Fury is looking really good. I'm strongly considering some more Death Company in my list. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics. I'll certainly be hoping to do a few more Blood Angels videos over the next few weeks. Finally, if you have been enjoying my videos and would like to help support the channel, I would just like to mention the channel's Patreon link, which is down in the video description. Making all of the tactics videos does take a fair amount of time, particularly enormous codex reviews like this, which take absolutely forever. If you would like to help support, anything is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain videos early before anyone else, regular votes to see what sort of thing comes next on the channel, and also automatic entry into the channel's monthly prize giveaway with a chance to win some big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.